Yeah, that's but I've, just, I've just discovered an enormous conspiracy that I'm uh, currently oh? unraveling. Okay, live on the podcast. Are, are you gonna? Are you ready to divulge, or do you need time? <laughs> this is big. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Monsters and Multiclass, your Dungeons and Dragons fix. I'm Kevin Odie. I'm Jared Bornigal, and I'm Will Mel. And we'll be hanging out with you for a while to talk about anything and everything D and D related. On this episode, we are taking a look at Baphomet, the first of many demon lords that we plan to cover over some period of time. No promises there. It could be three years like the multi-classes. Who knows? But it's the first one. Baphomet, demon lord. Yes. All right. Baphomet, the the horned king, which is, I think, uh, the one that I liked a lot because he's got some big old horns, a 20 foot tall minotaur uh, with six iron horns to be specific, and not a single fuck to give about your party. Uh, This demon lord clocks in at 23 CR and has enough history to fill at least two to three well-written blog posts or about one good uh, YouTube essay. Uh, We will not be covering every single aspect of the lore or history of Baphomet because it's it's extensive and that's not entirely our thing. We're going to be talking about it. It'll come up. uh, But if you have little bits of lore that you know about Baphomet that you want to add in, think it'd be relevant to discussion or think of things along the way, feel free to leave comments. But if we miss something, don't be surprised because this is not a lore breakdown to, yeah like i said that's not our that's not our thing we talk mechanics a little bit of lore how to work it in a game what's cool about it what's not that sort of stuff exactly it's always been our style of monsters it's very much a baphomet as in fifth edition dungeons and dragons right and what we remember to bring up so yes. let us begin by talking about baphomet's goals so baphomet is chaos plain and simple Civilization is a weakness and savagery is strength. Ooh, how brooding. He's worshipped by those who view others as little more than prey to be used for their own vile means and overall is just a, a scary, scary dude. So with that brief overview, let us dive into the labyrinth of Baphomet's stat block. <laughs> That, that part I pre-prepared, yeah. Right, yeah, because he, he likes mazes. <laughs> yeah, he likes mazes. Because he's like a big minotaur. Well, minotaurs are like small hymns. Yeah, that's more accurate. That's your first lore drop of the episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, in Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. And yes. like the mythical idea of a minotaur. I think Baphomet is based off the mythical idea of like a souped up minotaur. Yeah, but then in Dungeons and Dragons lore, they decided to like reverse that and say, no, 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 Baphomet was first, and then Minotaurs are little little hymns in his image, and that's why they like mazes. So they kind of did old switch room reversal there. But well, you did say that this topic is specific to D and D fifth edition, so I have purged all of my knowledge <laughs> of things that are not D and D fifth edition. That sounds problematic. Extremely. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> what's that weird contraption behind you? I have no idea. Weird. Okay. <laughs> what are we talking on? Baphomet. We're talking on Baphomet. Yes. I meant like how are we physically communicating? I computers okay. aren't. Let's easy just move on to the stat yeah. block. <laughs> Not drag that one out for too right. long. <laughs> so, uh, taking a look at the stop stat block, as mentioned, we are looking at a challenge rating of twenty three. And Baphomet, the name, is going to like lose meaning after a while. It's like saying spatula too many times. Uh, but either way, Baphomet, armor class of 22, HP of 275, and a speed of 40. Uh, first off, I feel like 275 HP for a challenge rating 23 creature doesn't really seem that high. It's pretty low. Like I feel like at this point you're looking at characters who are putting out I don't know, 50 damage a turn pretty easily. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. Interesting. It does have high AC and very high saves, though. So it is. Yeah, he is hard to hit. Yeah, it's not like you're going to just like, you know, banish them and forget about this fight. I, by any right. It's noticeable because like the little next stat block from Out of the Abyss where these were first recorded is the Demogorgon, which clocks in like 496. Yeah. So it's. <laughs> The, these distances are huge. It's 406, it's but a, yeah, that's yeah. still a big difference. And what's the... Yeah, same AC. Yeah, I would think Baphomet would have like the higher health because that's like 
He's a tank. What he is. Yeah, he's like, yeah. So, eh, hey, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, and we never specifically said these stat blocks, they are in the back of Out of the Abyss, but also in uh, Morden Canaan's. Correct. Yes. And if they're the exact same stat blocks? As far as that, I guess I did not pull up both in compare. <laughs> okay. I'm assuming. Usually it's just a reprint like that. <laughs> sure. And if they were changes, I'm sure that uh, Morden Cadence was probably for the better because this book mm-hmm. can do no wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> looking at the stats, we've got... 30 for strength, so plus 10 to strength, uh, plus 2 to dexterity, plus 8 to constitution, plus 4 to intelligence, plus 7 to wisdom, and plus 3 to charisma. So not a single negative stat, all Mm -hmm. just good. And saving throws, we get our plus 9 to dexterity, plus 15 to constitution, and plus 14 to wisdom. So I would like to point out, those are all like the big ones, the common ones. Though I, I made the, the joke about, like, you won't just banish him and forget it, but um, banishment is, I guess, kind of an option. Is that a charisma save? It is a charisma save, yeah. Okay, so there's plus three to that. That said... No, with advantage and legendary resistances, which we haven't gotten to yet. But. Right, right. And also, where are you banishing it to? Because, like, unless you're fighting it on a different plane, will that even come up? Right. I mean, yeah, so I, I guess if you're, like... In the abyss, yeah, you banish him for a minute, and then he'd just be back. Yeah, it's not really solving the problem. Yeah, I mean, if there is all this talk and lore about demon lords attempting to take over other planes, so I mean, that absolutely could be a plot point um, where there's like an initial little demon incursion, and they're at their chaotic essence taints the land, uh, and if it takes hold, a portal to the abyss opens, which is a random random where it is and it could take a long time for demons to find it because the abyss is theoretically infinite and so there may be no demons around it and but if they start pouring through and they are not fought off and the portal is not closed they will like a full-blown incursion will happen and they will permanently taint the land draw the attention of a demon lord who wants to take advantage of this and then eventually they'll come through the portal take control of all the demons that are there and go and actually try and you know take over the land basically make it just another realm of the abyss and so absolutely, that that's kind of like very, very classic D&D campaign stuff. Trying to stop that from happening. Right. I was going to say, that's for perfect it. for epic campaign scale. It would be mm-hmm. terrible if demons came out of the abyss. <gasps> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but I'll say, obviously, I think you could throw into your own homebrew campaign, wherever, because Out of the Abyss is also, it's almost more of an Underdark campaign than it is a demon campaign, it feels like. Yeah, the amount of demon the, fights I mean, were actually pretty limited. Yeah, they they, they kind of like, their the chaos that they like put into the Underdark by being present affected everywhere you go. That was like a really common thing as you're going through like you know, i dm that one and explaining like oh these people are kind of crazy because demon magic and things like that it was kept coming up demon magic Basically, for every yeah. every single problem yeah. yeah so for something like that like yeah you banish them back to the abyss and if you concentrate for a minute they would stay in the abyss that's how banishment works um but they just come back but yeah even if you kill them they just come back it's yeah. complicated yeah demons killed out of the abyss just go back into the abyss and then yeah, okay, so banishment is even if it succeeds, which from a stat perspective, high chance, well, all right chance compared to other things, but uh, it's not really dealing with the problem. It's more pushing yeah. it down the road for a little bit. Yeah, well, even killing them is. So right. it's more like we banish them either through killing them or the banishment spell, hoping you're praying to get that off, uh, and then finding a way to close the portal. Right, right. Which overall sounds like a pretty cool encounter. Anyways, Campaign. moving on. What's that? <laughs> I couldn't imagine trying to fit all that in one encounter. No, 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 no. You're right. Sorry. I guess I <laughs> yeah, view yeah, encounter as like arc. a set yeah. piece. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, skills we get plus 17 to intimidation and plus 14 to perception. I always love, well, like, what does intimidation even need to be on there? I was thinking that. It's like, it would just let it auto exceed on everything. Right. Like, it, it, it's fucking Baphomet. He's <laughs> terrifying. And, like, what DM has been setting up some type of 
again, epic scale campaign. And they get to the point that let's even say like a god and Baphomet are arguing and they're like, oh, yeah, Baphomet's going to try and intimidate the god. Let's see what (laughs) role they get. It's like it doesn't matter. The role doesn't matter. (laughs) Right. It's intimidating. (laughs) Damage resistances, we have cold, fire, and lightning, which I didn't see anything specifically in the lore about. I don't know if anyone else did. That's just demons. Yeah, I think that's all demons. All demons? At least all all the demon lords, at least quickly looking through them, yeah. Okay. And all the demons have resistance to those, the big three. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep, looking at the other ones, cold, fire, lightning, having resistance. Okay. And then we have immunity to poison, and then bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing that is non-magical. Which, if you're fighting this thing, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing that's non-magical, hopefully is not a thing. I don't know who's trying to hit Baphomet with a table leg, but (laughs) they've made a mistake. (laughs) Yeah. Condition immunities, we have charmed, exhaustion, frightened, and poisoned. Nothing too crazy there. And then no. senses, yeah. true sight, yeah. out to 120 feet. And languages, it knows all. And has telepathy Ooh. out to 120 feet. Yeah. So I guess in theory, you could like paralyze Baphomet, petrify him. Yeah. I mean, beyond like the that. legendary resistances that he has... There's really a lot of spells that would work that I think normally right. are are considered more big boss killers that are shut down on these high challenge rating monsters because you just don't want the fight to be over out of nowhere. Right. And you're basically saying hold monster works on Baphomet. If you get it off, it's, that's a wisdom save though, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Okay, so that's plus 14. Probably not going to be succeeding that too often. Right. Plus 14 with advantage, but it is possible. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the saves to target here are going to be charisma and intelligence. Not that I'd expect a party to know that. I think I think it's a little bit self-evident when you meet this wall of beef. (laughs) You shouldn't be going like toe to toe on strength with them. Yeah, that that part's (laughs) obvious. (laughs) <laughs> and with her strength, there's always constitution. So, okay, probably not a good idea. Yeah, intelligence would be would be the one to go for. I don't know if there's many intelligence saves that are going to help you in this case. You could feeble mind them. <laughs> yeah, but then I don't know if it would really matter, though. <laughs> does it change much? Yeah, it's like, oh, no, no it's, it's dumb, and now he's just attacking everything. Like, oh, yeah, that was already happening. <laughs> it no. doesn't change. And, and also, they could still, like, feeble mind it's called out. They still know who their allies and friends are. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Though, right. um, that, that said, just quickly, is it does mention a couple of times that he's by no means stupid. An 18 no. on your stat block when you have all of these massive, massive stats next to it seems low, but it's like a point in the lore where it talks about his shrewdness and his, you know, his cunning and his patience and everything. So I guess a lot of that yeah. comes from from wisdom, but yeah, that, just that's all demon lords. The lowest intelligence demon lord is a 16, and that's um the null one. I'm blanking on his name. I was you know just who. looking at it. You know, Guru, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, to become a demon lord, you have to be pretty shrewd and smart. I, I guess real quick, we, we, we kind of skipped over it. Um, demon lords are... So when demons are born in the abyss, if they keep surviving, they mutate and gain more traits and grow stronger generally with time. It just due to the chaotic power of the abyss. The ones that survive for a very long time become demon lords. Um and usually that requires a great intellect and cunning and planning to be able to survive such like a harsh environment where all the demons kind of a lot of time just fight for power amongst themselves and kill each other. And then the demon lords kind of ascend that and then have the ability to exert their will over others. There's based on the lore here in fifth edition, there's just countless demon lords out there that most people have known nothing about. The ones like Baphomet and the other ones we'll cover kind of in the series are the ones that the scholars know about the ones that have a mind to influence the material plane and have cultists who follow them and things like that. I always love lore like that because its entire purpose is just to say, 
feel free to make more demon lords and don't right. think that we're limiting you here. All right. Just right. if you think of a new one, go make another demon lord. Have fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like a giant minotaur, but he has like seven horns. Whoa. All right. That's yeah. not in the lore. Yeah. So maybe <laughs> take it back. And we call him uh, Daphomet. Uh, if it's seven horns, it's just thinking Caphomet because it's just C instead of a instead of a yeah, B, yeah, like so. going one letter further. Uh, yeah, eight horns okay. would be Daphomet. Eight horns, yeah, yeah, there we go. Eight <laughs> horns, Daphomet. Octophomet. <laughs> I was say, Zaphomet gets crazy. <laughs> it's like 32 horns. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, do you have more? Well, I was going to move on to Snaplock. Go for it. Yeah, so then the uh, he has a bunch of kind of like, it's like, it, I can always refer to them as passive. They're not quite passive, but they're not in action. Um, just features, I guess. So he's charge if Baphomet moves at least 10 feet straight toward a target and then hits with a gore attack on the same turn. The target takes an extra 3d10 piercing damage, average of 16. If the target is a creature, it must succeed on a 25 strength saving throw or be pushed 10 feet away and knocked prone. Easy, Scary. easy save. Yep. <laughs> Scary to be hit by. The extra damage, I think, could be higher for a challenge rating 23. That's going to be the theme of this monster. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that too kind of reading through. <laughs> that was like a little teaser of the rest of it. Yeah. Um, then no. again, it does all add up. Well, we could circle back to that once we cover all of his attacks, but. But otherwise, I don't think the charge itself is anything too groundbreaking. It's it's a charge. Does extra damage. Cool. I like the fact that it knocks you prone or it has the chance to knock you prone because that makes everything else pretty a lot scarier. That mm-hmm. said, I think that this creature is going to have advantage on most everything it does anyways and not really need to knock people prone. Uh, due to the reckless attack that you will also get to in a second. Right. So I don't think that this is going to, beyond the extra damage, I don't know how much it's going to really help or be a game changer, but we'll see. Right. It's thematically fitting. I mean, he's a giant minotaur. Anyways, uh, then he does have Nate's spellcasting. Okay, so I guess if you feeble mind him, you take this away. Uh, his ability is charisma, so it's a spell save DC of 18. Um, and innately cast the following spells at will, detect magic. Can't see that coming up a whole bunch, but I guess you're not sneaking any magic things by him. Three three times a day each, dispel magic, dominate beast, hunter's mark, maze, and wall of stone, and once a day, teleport. And just a small point to add, that's innately cast the following spells requiring no material components. Sure. Which yeah. can definitely be nice. I guess that it still would require semantic and verbal though, right? So you can't like not counterspell. It's counterspellable. Yeah. Okay. I think. I feel like I remember reading something about that at some point where. But it only called out no material components. So yeah, it should still be able to be counterspelled. Okay. If that doesn't sound right, want to correct us? Yeah. Comments, wherever. Yeah. Um, so Dispel Magic, very useful for a boss monster to have. Yeah. Three times a day innately. Definitely pretty, mm-hmm. pretty useful. Yeah. Dominate Beast is definitely fitting thematically, but I don't see it coming out much. It's it's literally can only be used on beasts. Yeah, and even and then, then it's you know, it's like Dominate Person or Dominate Monster, but Dominate Beast. If you wanted to be really cruel, you could do it to the Ranger Beastmaster's uh, companion. Cast Dominate Beast on him. Turn him back Sh- on you. Yeah. I mean, that's the same. I would have rather just had Dominate Monster. And then yeah. you could do it on the, the party members. Like <laughs> That makes a lot more sense. Including also being able to do it on the Ranger's Beast if you wanted to waste it. <laughs> yeah. In that case, it's definitely a waste. Yeah. Uh, probably an easy change. Something I would most likely do is just swap that out from dominate beast to dominate monster. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. I don't really see a reason creature to... then. Yeah. Hunter's mark. Nice. Again, fitting. Um, I guess we didn't cover this quite yet. Uh, a lot of the lore of Baphomet is the love of the hunt, the uh, excitement of knowing the 
the fear you are causing in your prey as they slowly succumb to exhaustion and realize their doom. I guess Baphomet feeds off of that. Yeah. He's not, he's not so much a swell guy. Um, <laughs> Hunter's Mark lets you kind of always know the direction of them. They can't. Oh, no. They can't. Right. I was thinking for some reason Hunter's Mark, you always knew where they were, but that's that's not that. You just get um, advantage on perception and survival checks to check, track them, which sure is fitting. The extra 1d6 damage, I, I guess Baphomet doesn't really have. No, it does have other concentration spells. You know, at such a high level, I don't. You know, no, I think it would still get used because, like, a, a level 17 to 20 ranger would still probably be using Hunter's Mark regularly. Sure, that's true. It's but... also a bonus action. Yeah, bonus action, get up there. Then, you know, it also has three attacks, so an extra 3d6 damage. Five, yeah. You know, and then they just have no qualms of dropping it if you want to use Dominate Beast or Replace of Dominate Monster or the Maze Spell or Wall of Stone. Yeah, that said... I definitely view this more as, just like I do for the Ranger, it should really be just a a trait that it has, like a a feature that it can put Hunter's Mark on something. I don't think it should be limited to three times a day. I don't even know if I think it needs concentration. It's Baphomet. What does it need to concentrate on Hunter's Mm -hmm. Mark for? Give it Hunter's Mark. Let it just mark somebody. This is a demon lord, and you're giving him a first level spell that's... Requires concentration, <laughs> yeah, and like right. does does as you said, three d six extra damage if it hits all of its attacks. Just let that happen. I mean, let it like focus on somebody and make it part of the fight. But sure, they, one of these features is Baphomet's mark or something. Exactly, then... exactly. And you know, you see him look at you, and a sear comes, searing pain comes on your arm, and you look down and see the mark of Baphomet. And right. now all of its attacks are directed at you, and each and attack does damage. And yeah, exactly. Why does it have to be a spell? <laughs> Yeah, I like that a lot better. It's also so much more fitting thematically about because if you're that player, like you're gonna you're gonna feel that's gonna be scary. Yeah, <laughs> like the player the, for the character. Yeah, and that fits in with exactly what Baphomet loves. And it's my favorite thing, especially as a a DM when you get that one player. Maybe not you guys so much, but the one player who's like overly cocky in a situation where they shouldn't be. That's always just like the <laughs> best time to break that stuff out and just be like, oh, okay, yeah, let's let's focus you first. Right. He gets the mace spell. Again, fitting thematically, I don't quite understand the appeal of the spell. It's four levels higher than banishment. Banishment is a fourth level spell, right? Yes. And it effectively does the same thing with a chance of ending it. Like it lasts 10 minutes instead of one minute. Right. Um, banishment adds like if, if you let it go for the minute and they, they were not, when you cast the spell, you cast in someone who was not on their native plane of existence and it lasts the duration, then they're permanently banished. They're just gone. They're at their original plane of ex- existence. Maze does not do that. If it ends, they just come back no matter where they are. And on every one of their turns, they can make a DC 20 intelligence check to solve the maze and escape. So it just seems like a worse banishment for four spell slots higher. I feel like I've got to be missing something. It's um, banishment doesn't have like material components either, I don't think. The so DC like, 20 intelligence check is actually pretty brutal. No initial save. Oh, shit. No initial save, okay. so it happens, and then That's they, it. it stays until they succeed. Nope, you got it. That's friend. Yep, I was missing something. Thank you. That, that I still makes it pretty don't solid. think that makes up the four level gap there. I don't know if I'd throw it at eighth level, but the fact that it's 10 minutes, I don't know. It really sucks if you cast Maze on the Barbarian who has a negative two to intelligence, even negative one. They literally cannot succeed. Right. So what? They're out of the fight unless concentration is broken. Yeah. Which puts it in a weird place mm-hmm. because if the wizard gets this, I would say this is actually substantially less bad than if the wizard got banished. Sure. But the Barbarian, like you just said, 10 minutes. Gone. Goodbye. Good luck breaking concentration on the Baphomet with plus 15 to its con saving throws. Right. So that... Yeah. That, that would be nice to give it a not fun territory. Like, I would feel bad using that as a DM. I always feel bad about using banishment. 
It's mm-hmm. it's a spell that I love players having. It frustrates me when like the enemy I want to attack gets banished, but it doesn't ever ruin the encounter because once you have banishment, I plan every encounter around you having banishment. No surprise. But yeah, just taking somebody out of the game for multiple rounds, I think it's just the general consensus that those types of spells don't feel great. I mean, even hold person, right. I'll paralyze somebody for a turn and it's like, oh, it's your turn. Make your save. All right, moving on. It's, right. It's not exciting. There's not much you can do about it, though. It is part of the game. Right. And then back on the banishment versus maze talk. Um, oh, if there's. So banishment's one minute. Maze is 10 minutes. But in the scope of like getting someone out of a fight, if they're out for a minute, they're out of the fight. <laughs> Usually, like, yes. Yeah, that's six turns, right? No, ten turns. Ten turns. Yeah. So that is a fair assessment. It's basically the same length of time. Right. If it was for... No. If it's out of the fight, it's out of the fight. So I'll be on team. Maze isn't really worth it. Yeah. The no initial save is nice, but... Again, yeah, I don't know if it's yeah worth four levels higher in spell slots. I do love the flavor of it, though. And in that regard, it wins out over banishment a hundred times over. Because every time somebody gets banished as a dungeon master, I feel like I have very little to explain for them to make their wasted turn feel somewhat interesting. You are in a void of darkness. Next player. Whereas at least with Maze, you could be like, ah, oh, you're taking wild turns left and right. This only works for like one or two turns for what it's worth. But you can at least explain something. And that's mildly neat. Right. It's it's so interesting because they, they're like trying to make it almost a mini game with the spell where you have to succeed the DC 20 intelligence check. It's you figuring out the maze. Yeah, that sounds cool. But it still just is no, there's no agency from the player. So unless the DM decides to change the spell entirely and throw down like an actual maze and they're like, hey, figure this out. When you figure it out, you can get unbanished. Right. <laughs> Which, yeah, as it's written, even though they had flavor about like, oh, you need to try and solve the maze and make a check. It's no different than just trying to like reroll your save about petrified or being held or whatever. It's just oh. doing another save at the end of your turn. It isn't doing a save. It's doing an intelligence check. Oh. The plot thickens. Turns out Does Maze it? itself is a labyrinth of a spell. <laughs> so an intelligence so that means that this is pretty good even on even on your smart characters, because it doesn't matter if they have proficiency or the proficiency bonus doesn't add to it. Most they're gonna have is right. plus five in a Strange world, they'll have plus six. So pretty hard to get out. I don't know. Yeah. It's still not great, but it just has weird stuff going for it. Right. Let's move on from Maze. I'm tired of this. Right. Yeah. And then Wallstone and Teleport. Um, Wallstone has its creative uses. Usually I see it more like when things are like going south for the party. Someone uses Wallstone like. Will's character does a lot to protect us. I don't see so much Baphomet doing that, but I guess he could uh, kind of control the battlefield a bit, close off areas. Yeah, I am almost trying to imagine how he could make like an actual labyrinth of the battlefield in real time. And I don't remember exactly I always need Will to remind me because, you know, you're actually using it. So do they they all have to be connected, correct? Yes, yeah. contiguous with at least one other panel. You get 10, 10 foot by 10 foot panels. Okay. So not so, not like a college level maze there. <laughs> no. No. Maze looking. Yeah, the only thing I could think is if you were already fighting Baphomet in a maze and this changed Which you the maze. should be. Which you should be. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess there's there's that aspect of it. And then teleport. I don't really see too much combat unless it's trying to escape. But again, I don't really see Baphomet doing that. Um, so just little ways to get around, I guess. You don't think? I, you don't think if, if Baphomet's like on the verge of losing, they'd teleport? 
Um, no, it, it would just be re- reborn in the abyss. So then that, you have, that would be the worst possible thing you could do for your rep as a demon lord. Yeah, that's fair. You would spend hundreds of lifetimes living that down. <laughs> so then where do you think the use of teleport comes in play? Is it getting into a fight? Appearing at inopportune times for players? Yeah, that's kind of just more like a hand wavy thing of why Baphomet I could just sort of appear wherever. <laughs> There you go. That's it's the DM's excuse to just say, "Yeah, Baphomet shows up." Pretty much. This is a random encounter. Yeah, he just showed up. It feels pretty <laughs> random, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, rest of the features here. Labyrinth. I looked at this before and I like said in my head of how to say it, and now here I am stumbling over it. We need Matt Mercer. Recall. Labyrinth. Uh, yeah, labyrinthine. Labyrinthine. Perfectly... Nope, nope. I'm sorry. Google says otherwise. Hmm. Labyrinthine. Oh, that yeah, makes sense. Labyrinthine recall. Great. Uh, Baphomet can perfectly recall any path he has traveled and is immune to the maze spell. Darn it! Great. All of my plans foiled. He doesn't <laughs> have a good int save or check. Yep. <laughs> Uh, three day legendary resistances. So if he fails to save, he could choose to succeed again. He was three times a day. Has the magic resistance trait. So his advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. Magic weapons. So all of his weapons are considered ma- magical. All his weapon attacks are magical. And then he has reckless. At the start of his turn, Baphomet can gain advantage on all melee weapon attack rolls during that turn. But attack rolls against him have advantage till the start of his next turn. It's identical to Barbarian's reckless attack. Which I think Baphomet would do every single turn. Right. Which is why I was saying before that charge knocking somebody prone really doesn't feel like it matters that much. Uh, yeah. Um, give advantage to his minions. He's okay. a demon lord. You're going to fight him with other like Garistos and Minotaurs and Cultists. and Actually, I can see that being really fitting. Like If there's a bunch of them around and you get charged by Baphomet and he rams you and you fly back 10 feet and fall on the ground. His minions, which they're all described to being very bestial and just wild and vicious, just taking advantage of that and just jumping on you and kind of ripping you apart. Yeah, that sounds pretty terrifying. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have player characters destroyed that way, very great way to show how scary these creatures are. Uh, Just that, that set right there if the players are like looking down from a hill and they see Baphomet destroying a city and just like as you said knock somebody back into a pit of demons that's that's the scariest thing ever yeah <laughs> so yeah the reckless though I definitely like I I like when class features are just kind of put into stat blocks they Reckless is one that definitely transfers well. Not all of them do. It's almost like Baphomet's like a a ranger barbarian multi-class. That's a big old stretch, but... Sure. I say that for a reason, okay? If you are looking to spice this fight up, those are the two classes I would go to. Is find good traits from those classes and add them to Baphomet. I was worried that you had like ruined your brain with our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's a good that's good input. Yeah. He could, he would benefit from favorite terrain. That yeah, <laughs> <laughs> most that's people would. <laughs> um, and yes, will the podcast has ruined my brain, but that doesn't mean there's not some good with it too. All right, Jared, take away the actions. All right, if I got it. Take it away with the actions. Don't take the actions away from us. We don't need actions. Baphomet is fine without actions. (laughs) So I'm going to go in a little bit of reverse order here and start with Frightful Presence. Frightful Presence is the same as you generally always see Frightful Presence. It's an action. Each creature of Baphomet's choice within 120 feet of him and are aware of him, must succeed on a DC 18 wisdom saving throw or become frightened for one minute. So that way, luckily, if you're just like, what, there's a demon lord in 120 feet of me? I had no idea. You're fine. (laughs) A frightened creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns and in the effect on itself on a success. And these later saves have disadvantage if Baphomet is within line of sight of the creature. 
If a creature succeeds on any of the saves or effect ends on it, the creature's immune to Baphomet's frightful presence for 24 hours. And this is the frightened, that's just the baseline frightened condition, uh, disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear is within line of sight and the creature can't willingly move closer to the source of its fear. Uh, so this is something we see on dragons a lot and really just a mm-hmm. lot of, of high level enemies, ones that are supposed to be scary, frightful even. I'm not sure how much benefit Baphomet gets out of using it beyond giving disadvantage to uh, or having the enemies have disadvantage on them. Because to me, the idea of them not being able to move closer doesn't mean anything to him. He seems like the type who's just like, yes, come at me. I'm charging at you. So like, let's duke it out. Fist to yeah. fist. I mean, it opens up a lot of opportunities for him to use his charge. True. True. If the barbarian can't get closer, lets it keep him at a distance. Right. So, yeah, you charge, you knock him back 10 feet. You hit him with your melee attacks, and then he backs up again for another charge. Ooh, that's rude. Yeah. But I guess that could be done regardless of the frightful presence. And with sure, but then the barbarian can't get up and then run at him to close the distance. If you knock him prone, I mean. that drops their speed a whole bunch. So yeah, you've already taken care of that. The fact that the charge knocks them back 10 feet takes care of that distance. And the fact that Baphomet's speed is 40. And usually you don't see that with with characters. I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to say that. Barbarians get extra speed. Your mm-hmm. tabaxi has ruined my game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tabaxi rogue. Yes, the tabaxi rogue combo is what did it. So, T-90 yeah, you're right. Feet around. That would actually be very frustrating for your character if you were frightened. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's worth starting the battle with this. That's what I was on the fence with. Enemy close. Yeah, you, it's the first action Baphomet does. Yeah, because one of my my issues with Frightful Presence usually is the opportunity cost. So you're giving up this these multi-attacks that we'll go over in a second. So it has to feel worth it. But I think I'm with you. I think that's worthwhile. You do that. You throw out your Hunter's Mark just because. And whoever, I don't know, would you do who is frightened or who isn't frightened? You'd Hunter's Mark. Not sure. I don't know if it matters. So. Yeah. Up to you. Up to you, DM. Be your own DM. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Then we have the multi-attacks. So Baphomet makes three attacks, one with heart cleaver, one with its bite, and one with its gore attack. And its weird axe sword thing, glaive, it's a glaive, is the heart cleaver. So melee weapon attack for the heart cleaver, plus 17 to hit, reach of 15 against one target, and does 2d10 plus 10 slashing damage for an average of 21. Pretty good. Good. I like the 15 feet of reach. Mm -hmm. The damage, not as terrifying as I'd expect. Keep going. Okay. All right. I had that initial thought reading through, and then it adds up. Um. I can do the math because it gives me the average yeah. to hit. It's, right. well, it's yeah. 57. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'll tell you what it adds up to. It adds up to jack shit. <laughs> All right. Bite. Uh, if you get a charge off, it gets up to 73. Right. 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 Yeah. Average is 73 around. All of these attacks probably have advantage. All of them have plus 17 to hit. You are probably hitting every attack. A single creature Go ahead. dishing out 73 damage damage on average around is insane you want to know how you can add 12 to that how hunter's mark oh hunter's mark yeah there you go so that's 85 average damage Mm -hmm. yeah i guess that's a little more impressive all right so next up it has its bite plus 17 to hit reach of 10 feet 2d8 plus 10 piercing damage and then its gore attack which it needs to do in order to get off its charge So that is plus 17 to hit, reach of 10 feet, 2d6 plus 10 damage with the addition of 3d10 if you get charge off. Those those are hard hits. So yeah, your Baphomet is not going to be one-shotting or one-rounding, I guess, challenge rating appropriate like PCs, but that does not mean he's weak. 
Right. I mean, he could be like knocking someone out in two rounds if he really focuses, which he sounds like he'd be one to do. Yeah, that's actually probably where the the scare comes from, because you're right. I mean, if most of those hit, let's just say not everything hits, even one attack misses. We're still talking about 50 ish damage and Mm. two of those one crit and we're seeing the the wizard go down or just any anything that's on the the wrong side of the d8 hit die right (laughs) or d10 hit die that's probably easier d8 d6s yeah yeah so and on top of that baphomet has some legendary actions of course we've got the same legendary action rules as everything else if this is your first time hearing about legendary actions a legendary creature generally has three legendary actions and get some options uh, that cost different amounts. Baphomet has heart cleaver attack. So Baphomet makes a melee attack with heart cleaver. So there's another 21 damage. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, actually, sorry. There's another 63 damage if it does it three times. And other one is charge. Baphomet moves up to his speed, then makes a gore attack, which costs right. two actions. Yeah, and these are after anyone else's turn. I don't know yes, if you said that specifically. I didn't, I didn't. Yeah, standard for legendary actions. Between turns, he, he can do this. So going back to my tweak of making Hunter's Mark just a, a thing can do all the time, I'd make that a single cost legendary action to cast Hunter's Mark. Okay. Just, yeah. It's, you know, it, <laughs> it takes away a single attack. It's going to be the non-optimal move but it'd be with the assumption of yes next turn is going to be doing more damage or whatever so right otherwise i don't know would you let it cast a spell as an action a legendary action doesn't really have many spells that need that spell magic okay um that, that would be very very beneficial for the stat block to be able to do that as a legendary action so you can react almost immediately to like a some sort of magical spell effect coming off um, and not have to use up your entire action to do so. Yeah, I could see that. Other one I could see, and I'm just kind of surprised of from a flavor perspective, is dragons also often get the ability to make a perception check as a legendary action to like track a creature. So if there's somebody who's invisible or hiding or whatever, uh, just expend a legendary action instead of their entire action to try and find them. So that, that seems like it's very fitting for Baphomet. Yeah. Uh, he does have true sight. So yeah, I guess invisibility doesn't matter too much. Right. But does that work against hidden creatures? Uh, let's see here. Monster True Sight can, out to a specific range, see in normal and magical darkness, see invisible creatures and objects, automatically detect visual illusions, ex- and succeed on saving throws against them, and perceive the original form of shape changers or creatures that is transformed by magic. Furthermore, the monster could see into the ethereal plane within the same range. So it doesn't really specifically say that. No, it doesn't sound like it to me. Right. So I guess just put Hunter's Mark on the rogue. So that it's no, because it still takes an action to try and find them, right? So I mean, it does have a perce- passive perception of twenty four. That you want to kind of justify that of like, yeah, you need to beat that to hide them. What does a level seventeen weird. rogue have in stealth? Like plus thirty two or some BS, right? <laughs> <laughs> so twenty four, as much as that sounds pretty high. I mean, every time Actually, you're right, you've got like plus fifteen to your your yeah, rogue. Yeah, I right think now. I have plus. Plus 14, um, and then if I were to get up to level 11, you get Reliable Talent, and then you could take it in Stealth, which a lot of rogues would do, which means uh, the, your minimum roll on a d20 is a 10, which would put my minimum Stealth roll at 24. Right, and your proficiency so, bonus goes up between now and then. I don't even right. think your dex is 20, is it? No, your no, dex is not. Jeez, okay, yes. Yeah, so there's it's 18. there's yeah. room to grow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you you're talking about like a minimum roll of 17 or sorry, 27. Uh, so yeah. yeah, the passive perception is it's not that impressive. Right. So I don't know, just let the rogue be cool and hide from Baphomet. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 so 
Because then I, you get into the issue where the rogue's just literally hiding every single turn. And what, you're telling me that Baphomet just can't find them ever? I guess that's not true. Once they kill all of their other friends. Then... Yeah, that's no, the, that's the solution when you're 20 feet tall and have six horns. You just kill, kill everything else that you see first. Yeah. Yeah, that's but I've, just, I've just discovered an enormous conspiracy that uh, I'm currently oh? unraveling. Okay, live on the podcast. Are, are you gonna? Are you ready to divulge, or do you need time? <laughs> this is big. <laughs> <laughs> well, while he's looking into that, I will take this moment a little later than I planned to tell you all to: if you're enjoying the video, if you want to hear the conspiracy, then you have to like the video. You have to subscribe. You have to subscribe where you get your podcast. Leave a five-star review. You have to for the conspiracy. Normally we say just leave a review. This time it has to be a five-star. And comment? Did I already say comment? Uh, okay. Leave a comment that says, yeah. what's the conspiracy, Will? <laughs> <laughs> it's like All right. Twitch chat. What do you got? <laughs> I, well, I hope all you right. all did that. This, this is going to be on the honor system. We obviously can't enforce it, but we trust you all, though. Just close the video now. Yeah. You know, that's really bad for the algorithm. Don't yeah, you can it. stick around. It's cool. Stick yeah. around. <laughs> yeah, stick around. <laughs> you remember when I when I was like, all right, it's from Out of the Abyss. Oh, it was reprinted in Morton Cunnings. Did they change anything? Oh, probably not. They did. Oh, shit. And it's big. Oh, my God. They moderately changed the uh, dice for all of his uh, attacks. Uh, 2d10 versus 4d6. Changes about three damage here and there. <laughs> Oh boy. In the original printings of Baphomet, the legendary action charge costed two actions, but in D&D Beyond, it doesn't say that anymore. Weird, because I'm in Mordenkainen's right now, and it costs two actions. I'm looking. Yeah. Wait, wait, where are you looking at it? Are you in, like, the encounter builder? Because that no. thing sucks. Oh, uh, so if you go to his like monster page, which is from out of the abyss, that's yeah, charge just one. Yeah, okay. it is slightly different. Yeah, I see that. Yes, all right. So we're specifically talking about uh, Morden Canaan's. I've already oh, forgotten. Is it Morden Canaan's? Morden Canaan's tomb of foes. Yeah. No, it's not. I, you, it's not tomb. No, You're supposed know, to correct me. I know. I don't care. <laughs> and did you say Baphomet? He did. <laughs> I, I am admittedly guessing on the pronunciation. This is one of those words that's just like anywhere you see it written and like D&D Beyond's not doing the pronunciation or anything like that. And I'm like 90% sure it's Baphomet, but that is just another thing yeah. for you to leave a comment on and let us know how wrong we are. <laughs> this is a throwback of uh, for where like we got on Beyond and all that and we just mispronounced everything. Mm -hmm. People would always kind of like correct us on it. Like, really that rudely. Hasn't, that hasn't been an issue in a while, but... They... Here we go. This might be one where it comes up. Beat the joy out of us. <laughs> we weren't allowed to mispronounce things anymore. The internet is mean. <laughs> All right, and to round out talking about a fight with him, um, he has layer actions, too. Yes. Which is a little weird, because um, his layer is in the abyss, which is generally a place people just don't go. Like, it's like a realm of infinite chaos. It's not like a navigable thing. But I, I guess if you go there, or you can maybe kind of change things where if he gets a foothold in the material realm, that becomes his lair. Sure. Like, brings his lair with him, uh, the palace of. Now, uh, here's another hard pronunciation. Liction. Liction? L-Y-K-T-I-O-N. Liction? I don't know. I'm not even going to try on that one. And we're just not going to, we're not going to call it anything. We're going to ignore it. Um, I could also see where we've talked about once he is slain, you have to then close up the, the demon portal. Or if you wanted to make it that the party has to go and, and fight him in his, in his lair, then I, oh, you have to go in the portal. And sure. After him and, and maybe yeah. like the first fight, you have a couple of NPCs help and they're just like spamming banishment. And they're like, we can't all go. We're all exhausted. You have to go into the abyss and take him out there. Oh, no. Oh. And then, yeah, okay, you've got a lair fight. And I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of ways that the, that could be reasonable. Like if he's going to be in a weakened state. He's going to be in a weakened state, so you have to go right now. And it needs to be a covert right. team because reasons? I always hate that one. Like, oh, we can't send an army into the abyss. That 
sounds crazy. It's like, well, sending us sounds crazy. What do you mean? Why would sending four right. people be better than 20? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's always that kind of hand wave justification of it's like, oh, too much will draw attention. We need them, that elite strike force. It's like, I mean, I guess kind of, but like, it's literally Baphomet's lair. <laughs> yeah. Like he's getting, they, they know what's around them. I mean. So what I do actually like using more, and I always remember this when I need to, it's the, we're going to give you a hundred guys. And then once you get in there, those hundred guys are going to have to do something else. Like they're going to get, I don't know, immediately murdered. Just be like, yeah, we'll send you in with an army and then just get wiped out by a demon horde <laughs> that you all can get away from. Right. But for some reason you can't leave. You have to finish it by yourself. Yes. Because he's yeah. in a weakened state. There is a time limit to right. it. Right, okay. So that, that part's important, too. Sure. Yeah, or it's... um. So his his, his lair is in the layer of the abyss called the Endless Maze. <laughs> okay. Which is pretty, so pretty gets self-explanatory lost. there. Right, yeah. It's like you go in with an army, and by the time you reach the layer, everyone has died. Except for, of course, the armor plot. Plot armor PCs. Okay, so what I actually think is a... That's a fantastic idea. Start with that. Second part is, depending on how well the party does in the maze, allow them to have a couple of NPCs for the fight. Sure. Give them a champion fighter or two and watch them, watch them, watch the tables turn on how they feel about that stat block. All right, so what are these layer actions? Once we do get right. there with our three NPCs? <laughs> All right, so the layer actions count on, come online on initial count 20, they lose ties. Um... They could take a layer action at that point in time and it cannot immediately takes effect and he can't use the same effect two rounds in a row. There are three options. Uh, Baphomet seals one doorway or other entranceway entryway within the layer. The opening must be unoccupied. It is filled with solid stone for one minute or until Baphomet creates this effect again. So just closing things off. Um, it does say that his palace is just as like labyrinth like as the plane that it's on. So, you know, getting to him is even if you get through the endless maze, there's still more of a labyrinth in his palace. So I could see that to separate parties and confound people and things like that. Right. Uh, second option, Baphomet chooses a room within the layer that is no larger than any dimension than 100 feet until the next initiative count 20. Gravity is reversed within that room. Any creature or object in the room when this hap depends falls in the direction of the new pole of gravity unless they have some means of remaining aloft. Baphomet can ignore the gravity reversal if he's in the room, although he likes to use this action to land on a ceiling to attack targets flying near it. Why Why don't the books do that more often? Like give little mm -hmm. like tips like that. Oh, right. Yeah, that is cool. Um, and I could totally see that happening. Yeah, that's a great idea. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the people like flying around taking pot shots, like, ha, he has no ranged, we got him, and then all of a sudden he just like flies up to the ceiling, like lands with a thud and just grabs him. Whack, whack. Just yeah. grapple him. I mean Right. Baphomet can grapple too. That'd make a good t shirt and I don't know why. That's just, <laughs> just Yeah. Just, I don't I know you were kind of making like a joke there, but I don't know if it'd actually be worth it. Because he would lose all of his multi attack. It would that would be his entire action is to grab one person. Honestly, if they are flying away and causing problems, it could be mildly worth it uh, because yeah. it still has legendary actions. So it's not like just doing no damage that turn. Um, that's true. Yeah, um, I'm going to say that that's a that's a a fringe case. Might not always be be worthwhile, but it has its moments. Um, otherwise, right. one thing that I found interesting about this part is it says gravity is reversed within that room, and for some reason that just drew to me like a multi-room fight. And I'm trying to think of how you would set that up as a battle map, as like a, a DM. Because you almost could like make a, a a labyrinth map that isn't difficult to navigate and the players like can you know, figure it out, but it's just never direct routes anywhere. You know, like you're on this side of the map, you need to be on this side of the map. Well, you got to go up and around and over, which... As I think Will mentioned earlier, you will be fighting him in a labyrinth. It could very easily be a multi-room labyrinth. Yeah. I don't yeah, know how fun cool. that would be, though. Yeah. Somebody has to justify this for me, because to me it sounds really <laughs> cumbersome. Yeah, I don't know if the labyrinth would be used. I think it would eventually end with 
pretty quickly like the party swarming into one room with Baphomet and then just fighting him in there. Okay, now we figured out how to make it interesting. It starts with players separated. They all, you know, come okay. out in separate areas and now they need to work to get to the same room together. And that's like part of the challenge. Right. Yeah, and with these layer actions, um, you don't need to actively be engaged with a fight with Baphomet to use these. These could just, he could do them anywhere in his layer. So it could be when you first enter the layer and you're fighting through Minotaurs and Goristos and Quasits and other demons that like take up residence there, that he's doing this every mission of count 20 to try and like stymie you. Yep, I could see it. I could see it. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, the last layer action uh, casts Mirage Arcane, affecting a room within the layer that is no larger in any dimension than by 100 feet, ends on the next initiative count, 20. Mirage Arcane is where you, it's an illusion to change the terrain of an area, um, or in this case, a specific 100-foot room. But it is an actual physical illusion. Like, you can make difficult terrain, you could cover up water with make it look like land but then actually walk over it it's kind of a weird one the actual spell lasts like 10 days and you can affect like a mile square we it's a seventh level spell so we it's just we've never had it come up at our table yeah i've used like hallucinatory reason, terrain uses, but a couple of times before yeah which is a really really paired back version of this right i'm legitimately having a hard time wrapping my head around how how you could use this and have it be more than people walk into a room, realize it's an illusion, and then, I don't know, be a little more careful in this room. Like, I'm having, I'm not. Well, even if it. it's an illusion, it still impacts them. Okay. So Making it's like, an illusion, maybe you could like see through it and understand that it's an illusion, but it's still physically there. Okay. It's, it's kind of weird. That's what I didn't get is like, yeah. are things, it, is it saying that, yes, it is actually there? Right. So you have a, a room as you're fighting your way to Baphomet where it's full of a bunch of flying demons and he does this to put spike growth or the like the souped up version of plant growth where it's like quadruple difficult terrain. Right. Or something like that in it. Yeah, that seems really annoying then. I, I wish it gave a couple of examples just like a like, oh, yeah, you could kind of replicate this spell or this spell, even if it didn't say the spell itself, if it just said like, here's some things you can do and some stats for it. So it would feel more, oh, well, it's not really a in combat spell with a casting time of 10 minutes now, is it? Obviously right. the legendary action gets around that, or sorry, layer action, layer action gets yeah. around that. Right. And it only lasts for one round as well. Right. That's an intimidating one. I don't think that's one that's mm. easy to just kind of come up with on the fly of ways to use it. I would be, I guess, challenge DMs to come up with some stuff beforehand. Just right. be prepared. And then finally, there are some regional effects. The region containing Baphomet Slayer is warped by his magic, creating one or more of the following effects. I'm just going to do these. Yeah, go through them. Don't really impact combat. Um, Plant life within one mile of the layer grows thick and forms walls of trees, hedges, and other flora, and they form small mazes. Beasts within one mile of the layer become frightened and disoriented, as though constantly under threat of being hunted. It might lash out or panic even when no visible threat is nearby. And if a humanoid spends at least one hour within one mile of the layer, that creature must succeed on a DC 18 wisdom saving throw or descend into a madness determined by the madness of Baphomet table. A creature that succeeds on the saving throw... Can't be affected by the regional effect again for 24 hours. It's just a little flavor. Right. And there is the the madness table, madness of Baphomet. I really, I have like no strong opinions about the other uh, two here. Plant yeah, life same. grows thick. Okay. It's not that interesting. It's just flavorful. Right. Uh, the only thing I'd say is with a beast within one mile of the lair become frightened and disoriented. That could be... Interesting flavor if your party has beast companions, not even, uh, you know, like a ranger beast master companion, but just pets. I know that's like a common thing. We have pets at our table right now, so I'm going to say it's common. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there you go. Have, have your pets bite their owner. Right. <laughs> it's Baphomet's will. Ooh. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then truly finally here, the um, all the demon lords have their own madness table, where if madness happens within the presence of the demon instead of rolling a normal madness table, which is this whole thing in the Dungeon Master Guide where you have like temporary magic and per- madness and permanent madness. If you yeah, go mad, fail a madness check in the presence of Baphomet, you get it's a flaw that lasts until cured. Uh, these are stuff like my anger consumes me. I can't be reasoned with when my rage has been stoked. Hate comes easily to me and I explode into a rage. The world is my hunting ground. Others are my prey. Things like that. Kind of. Um, it's pretty intense. Yeah. Like, I mean, these are character ruining flaws. They can be cured, which it goes into more detail in the, the DMG of curing madness. But it's, yeah, I mean, before a a fight, it's not something I'd really want to have. Or, you know, trapped in a labyrinth. I don't want my anger consumes me. I can't be reasoned with when my rage has been stoked. Yeah, that doesn't really seem conducive to a adventuring right. party. Yeah, it's okay. It is just a greater restoration to cure it. So I guess at the level that you're fighting Baphomet is not that. Is that considered that infinite terrible. madness? Yeah. The indefinite, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't yeah, see that. A greater restoration will cure that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be necessary. So, I don't know. I mean, hopefully the yeah, party succeeds possibly, like, for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Then I say, depending on the source, remove, remove curse or dispel evil and good might also prove effective, but then a greater restoration or more powerful magic is required to rid a character of indefinite madness. Yeah, and we we did madness a little bit in Out of the Abyss, right? Yeah, we did the one where you didn't just get indefinite madness. It was um, this kind of stacking thing. The first time you failed, you got short-term madness, which was like 1d10 rounds or something. I guess I have the chart up. Uh, last 1d10 minutes. Um, then you noted that, and then it went away. And then the next time you failed a madness check, it would you would get long-term, which is 1d10 by 10 hours, and then it would go away or cured. Noted, and then the next time you would then get the indefinite madness would last until cured, and then it would reset. So I don't know if you guys ever actually got to indefinite madness. I don't think so. We definitely got long term madness a couple of times, I believe. Right. And I don't really remember it coming up. I'm trying to remember like what times it it happened, but it definitely can be a good role playing experience. Um, I don't know if if everyone took to it in our game that time around. Yeah, there was a long term madness that came. this was a written in one related to Yinogu, where you guys kind of like accepted something, which then had this sort of curse aspect where you got the indefinite madness of the flaw of you love the taste of human flesh; it's all you crave, or it was something like that. Yeah, which you guys just kind of downplayed it and come up too much which is okay yeah like, i understand like that that's again kind of character ruining like that was not who you were all playing and you were like it was a heroic campaign <laughs> we weren't just but, like, gonna turn into cannibals right <laughs> yeah that was i think that was the issue with some of these more indefinite ones or was that a long-term one that was indefinite okay yeah last until cured yeah yeah they you really do have to be kind of prepared for it to totally change your character which i think in some campaigns it works better than others i putting it together i feel like for out of the abyss it didn't work well because we had such a specific goal which is not a a flaw or anything of it's just kind of the state of that campaign was you were working towards a goal and some of those indefinite madnesses even some of the long-term madnesses were like now this grinds everything to a halt and this has to be dealt with because it is so personality changing. So I've always been interested in the madness. I feel like it's it's worth trying again. But the only times I like using horror in D&D is in like short term campaigns at low levels. I feel like the horror vibes really wear off after level five. So mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to to make that work. Let us know if you have in the comments. <laughs> But yeah, that's Baphomet. I want to talk about labyrinths because I feel like that's worth a five minute discussion. Okay. Because 
that I think is one of the fatal flaws that we've come across with Baphomet here is labyrinths in D and D are very difficult to run and just don't generally work out well. Uh, most things that you provide are in a top down perspective for maps and it's weird to try and like cover stuff up and to try and get players to forget what they've already seen and to really capture that feeling of existential dread that comes from being in a labyrinth unless you make it very boring, which doesn't really add tension. It just means you're, you know, we take a right. Did we go the right way? And the DM says, no. And you go, okay, we go left. Did we go the right way? Yes, for now. And that's like for, what, 30 minutes you go back and forth doing that? Right. And we've had one successful experience with what was intentionally a very simple maze. And I I threw in like other challenges to it. But and like the actual design of a labyrinth and the point of labyrinths is to make you feel lost and confused and worn out. And that doesn't translate well to RPGs, I don't think. Um, That being said, how you did one, I thought that worked well. It did work all right, but it only worked because I accepted the fact that you all had like flying abilities and such. Um, so to, to go over what I did, I, I put down a map on our little battle map area and it was a top down view of the map and I got a giant piece of paper and I cut out like a 10 foot square in the paper and I placed one person's character in the center and basically had them move throughout it while we were like moving the paper along. And the whole point was just to get to the center. Overall, it was a pretty basic maze. But what was, I guess, nice about that and made it not just be totally frustrating was that you guys were able to scout by, you know, sending your familiar up in the air. And I would take off the sheet of paper and give you some time to chart your course and figure things out there. Um, the way that I made you feel lost was by doing the teleportation chance. I basically had like little trap points throughout the maze. And if they walked past them, they'd teleport somewhere else or potentially take some damage or whatever. Um, so I, I guess that did work out pretty well. I don't know if it would really feel like a labyrinth of Baphomet though. So I don't know what to do. I don't know how to make labyrinths like actually the course of labyrinths fun in D and D. And I really don't know if there is an option. So my suggestion is don't beat your head against a wall and try and make it work. Um, that was kind of my goal with that specific maze where I was like, if it's short, if you guys get past it in 10 minutes, that's okay because I'd rather it go too short than too long. I don't know sure. if that's the best advice, but that's what I got. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys were in a lab without the abyss. Baphomet was in that. Um, you didn't specifically fight him. Oh, yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. And it, it was just a series of checks and saves, intelligence checks, things like that. Um, I think it was kind of gave the direction. Like, let the players be creative if they say, I want to use, I want to use survival to look for if there's tramplings on the ground with the minotaurs or, or something like that, you know, let, let them do it. I think things like that, but it was just basically like a skill a series of skill challenges. Yeah. I just say that is a skill challenge. So that's one way to yeah. do it. And I don't think that's a bad way to handle it. That no. seems, you know, it works. It's, it obviously wasn't super memorable because, but it also wasn't memorable in the sense of like, oh my God, remember how boring and bad and stupid that labyrinth was? Right. <laughs> That's <laughs> a very fair way to put it. And I think that is like the most you will get out of labyrinths is make them not annoying. And that was a perfect example of that where it's like, oh yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't bad. It was fun. It was mm -hmm. a normal amount of D&D &D fun. Right. Because it's a skill challenge. And skill challenges, to me, have like a cap at how fun they can be. Right. <laughs> so that's it. I just wanted to say that piece on labyrinths. I do have one last point to add. That is that uh, I also find demon lords kind of difficult because it's, it's kind of hard to talk about chaos. And, 
chaos is just like this, you know, totally out there entity that we just don't see pure, pure chaos. So when I have a hard time uh, describing things, which I often do, I turn to describe our affiliates and read off things like chaos roils around you, lightning flashes, hunks of floating earth collide with a thunderish crash, gouts of flame mingle with gusts of wind, towering waves and jutting daggers of stone, each obliterating the other before reforming again. The entire landscape seems to shift and twist with a mind all its own. Ooh. That's actually really cool. Isn't it? So, yeah. Describe gives you fantastic descriptions like that for your D&D game. I always turn to it when I'm having a hard time of setting a scene. Love using it before my games, but if you're caught out without uh, any preparation as it happens, then you can always search and find exactly what you're looking for. I have not been disappointed yet anytime I look for a, a description. I don't know, that's it, it's a description. So check them out. You can get 10% off your subscription using the code MM10 and become the best DM you could possibly be. That's all I got. Sports oh. show, check us out. MonstersMonsterClass.com Check out our Patreon. Yes. Patreon subscribers. Do you want me to read them? I got them. Yeah. They're great. They're great people. I love them all, except for Jeff W, Joe P, Vincent M, Isaac M, Sentinel D20, <laughs> Star Shinobi, Adam A, Home Bakery, Ed G, and Bob Francis. To you, 10... I love you extra. Cool. And as always, thanks for watching.